Sunday, May 23, 1982, two roommates, 21-year-old Lori Lister and 18-year-old Melinda Aguilar, experienced a terrifying attack in their Houston, Texas apartment. He attacked me like just before I reached the staircase because he didn't know if I was upstairs or downstairs. And he came behind me, but then he pulled me underneath into this patio area here where we, we were kind of hidden behind the fence there. A man seemed to target them with the clear intention of killing them. He tied them up and tried to drown Lori in their apartment bathtub. He went outside and I, and I heard him dragging her up the stairs and I could hear her body um, hitting the steps. However, Melinda successfully escaped by pretending to faint and then jumping head first off her balcony. She sought help, and with the assistance of a neighbor, both herself and her roommate were saved. The culprit? 28-year-old Coral Watts was arrested as he attempted to escape. What no one could have expected was that he was not only involved in just these two attempted murders, but was also suspected to have killed close to 100 other women. I said to him, Coral, I haven't got enough fingers and toes to count the amount of people you have killed. And he looked around and said, there are not enough fingers and toes in this room. And there were four of us in the room. He confessed to killing 13 women and received a 60-year sentence in 1982. Then, in a shocking twist, in the early 2000s, this man, who had committed numerous murders, was on the verge of being set free from jail. This was because of a controversial legal ruling that changed his classification to a nonviolent felon. Surprisingly, under Texas law, well-behaved nonviolent felons could deduct three days from their sentence for every one day served. Watts, a model prisoner, had enough time deducted to potentially be released as early as May 9, 2006. Texas isn't going to let a serial killer out of prison. That's not going to happen. Somebody's going to do something, but nobody did. The police, victims' families, and the public were left in utter shock and fear. The lingering questions haunted everyone. Why, against all reason, how could the killer be released? Can there be any conceivable justification for setting free a serial killer responsible for a multitude of deaths? Carl Eugene Watts, known by his nickname Coral, was born on November 7, 1953 in Colleen, Texas, to Richard Eugene Watts and Dorothy Mae Young. His father served as a private first class in the Army, while his mother worked as a kindergarten art teacher. Before Watts turned two, his parents separated, and after this, he was raised by his mother. They relocated to Inkster, Michigan, and in 1962, Dorothy May married a mechanic named Norman Caesar, with whom she had two daughters. When he was eight years old, Watts and his sister battled meningitis. The illness nearly claimed his life, leading him to be held back in school an extra year and causing him to miss the third grade. Herman Kiefer Hospital became Watts' temporary home, where he underwent spinal taps and had to be isolated from other patients. Reports from journalists suggested that Watts' body temperature reached alarming levels, raising concerns about potential brain damage. Following his illness, his family noticed a transformation in his personality. He became bashful, quiet, and introverted, with a compromised attention span and a deteriorating memory. Struggling to keep up academically due to being held back a grade and suffering from chronic sleeplessness, Watts began having violent dreams about combating and killing malevolent spirits of women, and these disrupted his sleep cycle. When later questioned about his crimes and why he killed his victims, he explained that he wanted to free their spirits because they possessed evil eyes. At the age of 12, Watts began to relish his sleep-induced fantasies of torturing and killing girls and young women. This was when Watts, who was a teenager, started stalking girls, and it's thought he might have killed his first victim before the age of 15. When he was very young, he told a psychiatrist that he just did it because it made him feel good. As a 15-year-old, uh, he realized that people could identify his face. He evolved, and he started attacking women from behind. 
At 15, Watts was identified by the police as the assailant in the attack on 26-year-old Joan Gave that occurred on July 29, 1969. During his newspaper delivery route, Watts knocked on Joan's apartment door and violently assaulted her when she opened it. Without showing any remorse, he continued with his delivery route as if nothing had transpired. Joan contacted the authorities and promptly reported the incident, leading to Coral's arrest at his home. Subsequently, he was mandated to undergo psychiatric treatment at the Lafayette Clinic in Detroit, a mental hospital. A psychiatric evaluation revealed mild intellectual disability with a full-scale IQ of 75 and a delusional thought process. Despite his poor academic performance, a police officer later described him as very, very intelligent with an excellent memory. Watts was released from the Lafayette Clinic on November 7, 1969. Despite academic struggles, Watts graduated from high school in 1973 and earned a football scholarship to Lane College in Jackson, Tennessee. However, he was expelled after three months due to allegations of stalking and assaulting women. Additionally, suspicion surrounded Watts in the cruel murder of a female student, contributing to his expulsion, although insufficient evidence prevented a conviction. Following his expulsion, he relocated to Houston, Texas. In 1979, Coral and Dolores Howard, his girlfriend, welcomed their daughter, Nakisha Watts. However, shortly after her birth, Coral and Dolores ended their relationship and went their separate ways. Coral then entered into a marriage with Valeria Goodwill. Shortly after their union, Valeria noticed Coral exhibiting peculiar behavior. He constantly rearranged the furniture, used knives to chop up houseplants, broke candles, melted them onto a table, and scattered trash around the floors without bothering to clean it up. Additionally, after moments of intimacy, he would abruptly leave, disappearing for several hours. Unfortunately, their marriage only lasted six months. Watts' murders officially began when he was 20 years old, in 1974, though there are suspicions he may have had more victims prior to this as well. He kidnapped his victims from their homes, subjected them to torture, and ultimately took their lives. Striking in various states, his victims were primarily thin, attractive white women who were between the ages of 14 and 44. Watts used different methods to murder his victims, including strangulation, stabbing, bludgeoning, and drowning. At 10.45 a.m. on October 25, 1974, Coral knocked on 23-year-old Lenore Nazaki's apartment door. Claiming to be looking for Charles, the name of one of his siblings, he engaged Lenore in conversation. When she opened the door with the chain still secured, Coral asked if he could leave a note. As she went to fetch paper, he suddenly attacked Nazaki and choked her into unconsciousness. Although Lenore later alerted police, they were unable to locate her assailant. Five days later, on October 30, 1974, Watts tortured and ruthlessly killed 20-year-old Gloria Steele, believed to be his second victim. A student at Western Michigan University, Gloria was also a mother. I was reading the Detroit News. They had a story in there that stated that the uh, victims were stabbed with a screwdriver. I immediately knew that it wasn't a screwdriver, that it was a wood carving tool. She was found with a crushed windpipe and 33 stab wounds to her chest, inflicted by a wooden carving instrument. He didn't face a direct murder charge due to a lack of solid evidence. The only witness, Diane K. Williams, an apartment resident manager, observed a black man searching for Charles around the apartment complex. Upon seeing Williams, Coral seized her, forced her door open, and dragged her inside. During their struggle, Williams' phone rang, prompting her to knock it off the hook and scream for help. As her attacker fled, Williams saw him getting into a tan Pontiac Grand Prix. In a police lineup, both Williams and Nazaki identified Coral, who had been apprehended for stealing plywood from the Western Michigan University campus. For the Nazaki and Williams cases, he was taken into custody and charged with assault and battery on November 16, 1974. After being diagnosed with antisocial personality disorder and attempting to take his own life with a length of cord at the Kalamazoo Mental Hospital, Watts was relocated to the Center for Forensic Psychiatry in Michigan. When questioned about the death of Gloria Steele in 1975, 
He admitted being nearby the day before Gloria died. However, he denied being responsible for her death, despite confessing to attacking approximately 15 other young women. A search at Watts' residence by Detroit police, conducted under a search warrant, revealed a wooden carving tool, but no evidence linking him to Gloria's death. During his trial for the assault and battery of Nizaki and Williams, Watts entered a no-contest plea and was subsequently sentenced to a year in the county jail. Psychologists evaluating him characterized Watts as extremely hazardous, lacking remorse for his crimes, reckless, careless, and emotionally distant, with a high likelihood of relapsing. After that, a series of attacks occurred in the Detroit region over the span of a year where he claimed the lives of five women. One peculiar discovery was that the majority of his crimes happened on Sunday mornings. This odd pattern earned the perpetrator the ominous nickname Sunday Morning Slasher from Ann Arbor newspapers, heightening the mystery surrounding the timing of these horrifying attacks, all occurring at around 4 a.m. In 1980, Shirley Small, a 17-year-old from Ann Arbor, Michigan, was fatally stabbed twice outside her home on April 20th. A similar attack targeted Glenda Richmond, 26, on July 13, 1980. Both cases lacked sufficient evidence for conviction, but exhibited Watts' characteristics. The first homicide directly attributed to Coral occurred on September 14, 1980, when 20-year-old graduate student Rebecca Huff was found dead, having endured around 50 stab wounds. A 20-year-old named Dalpy survived an attack on October 6, 1980, but suffered severe consequences, including partial paralysis and muscle weakness. On November 1, 1980, a 30-year-old woman, Agnes, narrowly escaped an attack by a hooded man resembling Watts after raising the alarm while returning from a Halloween party. Although she identified Watts from photos, the dimly lit surroundings left some uncertainty. In July 1980, local homicide investigators turned their attention to Watts, prompting the formation of a task force to delve into the Sunday slashings. Watts came under sporadic surveillance, and in November, a court order allowed officers to install a tracking device on his car. On November 15, 1980, around 5 in the morning, two patrol officers near Main Street in Ann Arbor observed a suspicious man in a car following a woman walking home. Realizing she was being tailed, the woman sought refuge in a doorway in an attempt to elude her pursuer. Coral, frustrated by losing track of the woman, was apprehended by the police when they pulled over his car for outdated license plates and driving with a suspended license. During the inspection of his vehicle, authorities found a package containing wood filling equipment and a few screwdrivers. Their most significant discovery was a dictionary belonging to Rebecca Huff, bearing the carved phrase, Rebecca is a lover. However, it proved insufficient evidence to link him directly to her murder. In the spring of 1981, Coral relocated to Columbus, Texas, and secured employment with an oil firm. During the weekends, he would travel over 70 miles to his next hunting ground in the Houston region. Between 1974 and 1982, Watts committed murders of numerous women, totaling dozens. Despite the extensive list of victims, Watts managed to evade detection as a serial killer for nearly eight years. Several factors contributed to this elusiveness. Watts operated across various jurisdictions and even different states, complicating the task of connecting the crimes. Additionally, his modus operandi diverged from typical patterns as he never engaged in physical intimacy with his victims, unlike many other serial killers targeting women and girls. Consequently, even with the emergence of DNA testing, linking the crimes proved challenging. Furthermore, Watts was not considered a suspect by those who knew him, and law enforcement did not identify him as a potential perpetrator until his arrest in 1982. On May 23, 1982, Melinda Aguilar, 18, and Lori Lister, 21, experienced a break-in at their Houston apartment by Watts. When Lori came back from work, Watts choked her down the steps outside the apartment. Subsequently, he entered the apartment and began strangling Melinda. Pretending to be unconscious, Melinda managed to escape being strangled completely. Watts' wire tied her hands behind her back with the intent to drown Lori. He carried Lori's body upstairs to the bathroom, filling the bathtub with water. However, Melinda seized the opportunity and leapt out of the window to seek help. What I did is I jumped as high as I could and went and did a somersault, and I 
actually hit my head on top and then um, when I came down, I landed on my knees. There was a lady sitting out, you know, out in her little porch area drinking coffee and that's, you know, I told her I needed help. Someone was trying to kill my roommate. Lori was saved and Watts was apprehended after he initially tried evading capture. While he was in custody, investigators started linking him to recent killings of women. Despite the connections, Texas prosecutors believed there was insufficient evidence to secure a murder conviction against Watts. In May 1982, following the attacks on Melinda Aguilar and Lori Lister, Harris County Assistant District Attorney Ira Jones negotiated a plea bargain. Watts would admit fully to his crimes, receiving immunity from murder prosecution in exchange for a charge of burglary with intent to murder. He agreed to a 60-year sentence for this offense. Watts accepted the deal, leading detectives to the graves of three victims. Finally, Watts confessed to attacking 19 women, resulting in the murder of 13. It was amazing how he, he never got the details of one case mixed up with the other. All right, what time of the day or the night? He said, I killed a girl left her beside a dumpster over, you know, on such and such a street. Of course, as soon as we heard dumpster girl in the street, you know, we knew what case he was talking about. He admitted to killing some victims, but also refrained from confessing to the deaths for a few. However, Michigan authorities declined to participate in the deal, leaving his cases in that state open. However, the hope for justice took a devastating turn when, shortly into his prison term, the Texas Court of Appeals ruled that Watts had not been informed that the bathtub and water he used in the attempt to drown Lori Lister were considered deadly weapons. This decision reclassified him as a nonviolent felon and eventually opened the door to early release. This was because Texas law at the time granted nonviolent felons three days deducted from their sentences for every one day served with good behavior. Watts, a model prisoner, accumulated time deductions that could have seen him released as early as May 9, 2006. The subsequent abolishment of the early release law, prompted by public outcry, brought little solace as it couldn't be retroactively applied as dictated by the Texas Constitution. In 2004, a plea for justice echoed across the nation as Michigan Attorney General Mike Cox sought information to convict Watts of murder and prevent his potential release. Joseph Foy from Westland, Michigan, bravely stepped forward, recounting the chilling sight of a man resembling Watts murdering 36-year-old Helen Dutcher on December 1, 1979. I had the volume down and the stereo on, and I was just watching the picture, and uh, I seen a black man being led into a courtroom, and as soon as they walked him through the door, I just, oh my God, that's the man that killed that woman in Ferndale. Helen had succumbed to 12 stab wounds. Foy identified Watts by his eyes, hauntingly describing them as evil and devoid of emotion. Despite Watts' immunity from prosecution for the 13 confessed killings in Texas, Michigan held no such agreement. As the 2004 trial approached, law enforcement officials implored the trial judge to allow the Texas confessions into evidence, a plea he accepted. Watts faced conviction for the murders of Helen Dutcher and Gloria Steele and received two life sentences without parole in a Michigan prison on November 17, 2004. He was sentenced to serve his time in a maximum security prison in Ionia, Michigan. However, he passed away from prostate cancer a few years after this sentence began, on September 21, 2007, in a hospital in Jackson, Michigan. In the end, he escaped once again from serving his full sentence for the lives he took leaving a somber end to his dark tale. Coral Eugene Watts, a malevolent serial killer, terrorized the country with his many, many killings. Despite confessions, legal loopholes allowed him to reduce sentence and almost led to his release. His later conviction for the 1979 murder of Helen Dutchner exposed the depths of his darkness. Watts, a chilling reminder of hidden evil, left the Ann Arbor murders unsolved casting a haunting shadow on his legacy. We hope you found the video enlightening. Share your thoughts in the comments about which case you'd like us to delve into next. Remember to hit the like button and subscribe to Mysterious Hook. Your encouragement inspires us to produce more captivating content for you. Until next time, stay curious.